Our social media producer, Christine Samra, asked Dr. Naya Narula with Stanford Healthcare about the latest guidelines. California is deciding to drop the mask mandate on June 15th. Do you think that's the right decision to completely drop it in place for now, um, considering the high vaccine rate here in the state and the efficacy of the vaccine? Like, should they be waiting until June 15th or should we coincide with the CDC and, and do it now? So as we know, the CDC dropped its latest guidelines on mask mandates for fully vaccinated individuals, meaning two weeks after the second dose of the Pfizer Moderna vaccine or two weeks after the single Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so these individuals are now allowed to go into indoor settings without masks. Now, California has opted to wait for another few weeks until mid-June, uh, which is when the economy is set to fully reopen. And I personally don't think there's any problem with that. Um, we've seen incredible progress towards vaccinations within our state. Over half of the vaccine eligible population has been vaccinated. Um, but we still have to consider the underserved communities where COVID has been hit harder um, with the infection, as well as vaccination rates being super low in these communities. Um, Additionally, adolescents also just starting to get vaccinated. So this is one of the reasons California officials have opted to wait and um, allow for a four week window so that as the state starts to reopen, businesses can also start preparing um, and responsibly work on the logistics for the return to normalcy. Um, the state's also going to be, uh, currently, um, they are working on issuing more specific guidelines and developing tools to help verify and validate vaccinated from unvaccinated individuals in an indoor setting. And um, just a few days ago, dropping the mask mandate um, and social distancing in an office and business setting is now being considered uh, with the caveat that all employees are vaccinated and they have proof of vaccination. With that said, our unvaccinated employees will then be um, asked to continue to wear masks and potentially even social distancing distance from their colleagues. Um, so we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, at this time, we just have to make sure that we get there safely um, and that we continue to move forward. So for for the time being, um, in the next few weeks, as these logistics are being ironed out, um, wear a mask in an indoor setting, um, even if you're fully vaccinated, we're going to get there um, in, in a very positive way. We just have to make sure we do it safely. So um, a lot of people are looking forward to traveling again. Um, if you're fully vaccinated, is it safe to travel internationally? Uh, yes, um, with the summer coming up, I think many of us are itching to travel, both domestically and internationally, and the CDC did update the guidelines on May 13th, stating that fully vaccinated individuals can safely travel um, at low risk. However, we do have to, uh, to realize that um, there are still cases um, that are rising and there are spikes in several countries, um, as well as the identification of new variants. And so for specifically for international travel, we are still recommending against it at this time. Um, traveling domestically is different um, at this point for fully vaccinated individuals and unvaccinated, they're still mandating masking at travel hubs like airports or stations, and also while en route um, in buses, trains, airplanes. Um, however, you no longer need to test um, before or after you travel. You don't need to quarantine. Um, of course, you wanna check with the state and local governments um, to at the destination that you're traveling to as restrictions may vary. But international travel is a little bit more complicated. Um, much of Europe is still closed um, to the American population. Um, and, and that's in part due to rising cases, but also the slow vaccine rollout. We've done a tremendous job here in the US. Um, it's been one of the best rollouts in the world. Um, but at this point, we are just not seeing that globally. Um, there are, however, some countries that have opened up their borders to Americans. Um, uh, and, and each country has their own protocol and entry requirements. So I'll leave our viewers with this. Um, at this time, we are, are we are not recommending international travel, um, but if you do choose to go to a country that has opened its borders up, it is crucial to check the coronavirus case rates, um, the local measures that they're taking, 
and the medical infrastructure um, in case you do get sick before traveling. And please continue to follow all the precautions. Um, even though you are fully vaccinated and are at lower risk, you may still be able to transmit this disease to local communities, um, especially where the vaccine rate is very, very low. Now, new research shows the vaccines may be less effective in those who have underlying conditions. Um, what do we know about that study? So our immune system is fairly complicated and um, we are still, as a medical society, continuing to learn more and more about it. Um, now, when these vaccines were studied, they were studied in healthy individuals in clinical trials. And we extrapolated that data and based on how vaccines have worked in the past um, in patients with underlying conditions that affect the immune system or that are, are patients that are on treatments that suppress the immune system, um, we expected there to be a um, blunted response um, to the vaccine, not as powerful um, in when compared to healthy individuals. Um, what we are seeing now that the vaccine has been out for several months um, and more and more people have gotten it here is that um, the response, the antibody response that we're seeing in these individuals is not as strong as we would have hoped for. Um, and it is a bit disheartening. Um, a paper uh, recently published at the beginning of May um, in the Journal of American Medical Association looked at 658 transplant patients specifically um, that found 46% of these patients that received um, the full vaccine course of Pfizer and Moderna um, that did not mount an antibody response. Um, and that's a substantial proportion of transplant patients that will continue to be at risk for coronavirus um, and, and the disease. Um, there's also some early data coming out of uh, Washington University in St. Louis, um, although not peer reviewed yet, that looked at groups of other immunocompromised patients such as people with lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, and rheumatoid arthritis and found that 15% of this patient population had either a blunted or no antibody response after being fully vaccinated. Um, we do know that the antibody response is not the only uh, thing that offers protection. Um, in HIV patients, we're seeing um, the T cell response, which is a type of white blood cell that um, fights infections um, to be more robust than the antibody response. Um, and so we've seen greater protection in, in that um, patient population. So at this time, we're still trying to kind of make sense of this um, research that's coming out in different immunocompromised populations. Um, and so while scientists are trying to comprehend this data, um, we are still asking our immunocompromised patients to act as if they have not been vaccinated, to take all the precautions um, that they would have had they not been vaccinated, and just as importantly, urge their family and um, close friends to get vaccinated, those that have a robust immune response, to offer an external layer of protection for these patients. Gotcha. Now, another new study shows a new vaccine candidate could protect us from a pandemic before it even begins. Can you explain a little bit about that one? Yeah. developed a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Um, and what this means is that this particular vaccine not only protects against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but actually multiple coronaviruses in the SARS family. So this particular one um, offers protection against SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for the pandemic, its variants, as well as the SARS-CoV-1 virus that, we, that was responsible for the outbreak in 2003. Um, and, and they've studied this vaccine in racist monkeys um, and have found that um, this vaccine not only protects against this particular coronavirus that we're seeing in the pandemic, its variants, um, but also other SARS-related viruses that have not jumped into the human species yet, but are circulating in um, bats and other species. So it's, this is actually a very exciting time um, because it can indicate that we may be able to tackle variants um, and potential coronavirus outbreaks. Um, looking back at history, every eight to nine years or so, or so, there is some sort of coronavirus outbreak. Obviously, this past year, it has been global, um, and it, it, it's been devastating. Um, and so this is an exciting breakthrough for 
future infections and potentially even protecting us globally um, against uh, future pandemics. So very, very exciting research coming out. Um, there are actually a few dozen teams across the globe working on this particular type of pan coronavirus vaccine. Um, so more to come on that. Um, they have not tested in humans just yet, uh, but uh, the, the initial research is very promising.